Welcome to part two of my teardown of the square terminal. So I've had a little more time to look at this thing. Um, last time I kind of just did a live teardown. I haven't dealt too far into what it's actually doing internally, um, but I had more time to do some research and I wanted to show you sort of what this, this setup looks like right now. So um, I have, oops, focusing on the meter here. Don't want that, there we go. Um, what I've done is I've basically taken all the boards out of this, which lets me play with them a lot more. Um, we're only really gonna look at this security board. So this is the one that uh, I had sort of identified as having this interesting shield and stuff. The other board here is your sort of uh, Android based uh, base board. Um, but if you pull it all apart, so actually I'm missing a few more things um, here right now. So. You can see, for example, that I can try to power it up. Um, and I don't have the display attached, obviously, so it's not going to be super obvious, but it'll make a sound as the printer tries to, to turn on. Um, we already saw previously that I think I killed, um, you know, erased a bunch of security keys uh, by tripping the tamper stuff. Um, so let's kind of ignore all of this and dive way further into what's involved in um, this actual tamper board here, right? So this is the, or the secure security board, let's call it, right? So this is the board, I get a better view. There we go. Um, the board that does the, the actual payment processing. Um, and this is the board that I think is gonna be, you know, pretty interesting to look at to, to see how they're doing uh, a secure design type thing. Um, so I identified a few of the parts last time. I'm gonna go through in a little more detail um, and also pull out some details of the the actual parts um, involved in it. So um, the first thing I'll identify is there was a few mistakes when I was doing the really quick um, overview video last time. So I had claimed this, this one, so the first thing to look at just pull the meter back here, is this NXP part. Um, so some of this is actually pretty standard. Uh, this, I thought, you know, I, I searched this TXD part. Um, it's actually this 8034. So this chip right here, if we search um, this chip, NXP8034, what you'll find is this is actually just sort of a standard smart card interface device. So there's nothing too um, too crazy about this then, uh, which makes sense, right? So this is your smart card device. Um, the second thing that's kind of of interest, if we look back at our board, okay, so that's that. Um, and we can see that this uh, thing, if we actually do some of the traces, this is going into this square I see here, whatever this is. So um, the two things I'm going to concentrate in this video are actually this this ASIC or whatever this device is um, and the tamper shielding, how that's working on this device. Um, so this is just some sort of, as I said, preliminary investigation. Uh, previously, I identified the, the NXP device, so we won't talk about that. Um, there's another, some unknown device here that's also marked with a square logo. Uh, touch screen controller again. So this makes sense. So if you take a look at the back side of the board, it actually has the interface for the LCD. Um, and you can just see these LCD pins being routed directly to here to the Android board um, and the touch controller. So the touch controller is actually done through um, through this board, which makes sense because if people are inserting their pins and stuff on the touch screen, uh, it's nice that it's done in this sort of security domain. Um, and we'll take a look at this STM32F0 and what it's doing. So, okay, step zero, this 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 square K400Q, what the heck is this part? Um, I should note, so actually one thing I, I wanna bring back is that if you take a look, so if you take a look at this board, um, it turns out this isn't quite as unique as I thought. So Square has some other devices out there. Uh, you might know the the simple card reader, right, which just uses the headphone jack. Um, they also have like a touchless little kind of square terminal, or not quite terminal like this, but little just no display terminal that goes on the um, the counter or stuff like that for touchless cards. So what I found is I was actually able to find, I'll just pull this up here, some teardowns of that. Um, and 
you'll notice it's going to be very similar. So here's the one teardown I pulled up. Um, and so you'll notice, for example, that it has that same main microcontroller. We have the same um, touch screen, or not touch screen, sorry, smart card interface, and that same square, whatever this guy is. Um, so we have a few, obviously, of the same things. Uh, we have, this is different. So in this device, it has a CC, let's go down here, where it has, it has the battery backup again. Um, yeah, this has a Bluetooth radio. So this, this um, terminal one doesn't have this radio chip inside this secure uh, area, as far as I can tell. You'll notice the um, tamper looks a little different. So we're actually going to talk about that later on when I look at how all the tamper works. Uh, it also has NFC and things like that. So, so it's interesting to note that if you're investigating this, there's actually a, an earlier gen that you can kind of take a look at. It's often pretty interesting to see what's changed between um, the two generations. So my other kind of theory is that, and the tamper-proof stuff looks a little different as well. I think this is a later generation one. Um, but yeah, so what's sort of interesting is if you take a look back at this board, right, and the fact that there's this separate Android part, um, it's possible, I don't know what the interface between the two is, but I'm also wondering if basically this is just using USB effectively, so this is similar to the previous device, um, and it's talking over USB to uh, this guy here, uh, which is just sort of an interesting, you know, it's, it's always cool to look at the design choices. Um, okay, so that was a bit of an aside I meant to bring up earlier. Back to this K400. If you search this thing, um, let's see, got some windows open here. Yeah, if you search this thing, you're going to find a few hits on, um, you know, the internet. And so it's pretty hard to find anything about this device, but you'll find some references um, to a company, Killy. Uh, and they were, or still are, effectively based in Toronto, which is great. Um, and they basically talk about how they have some devices with this part number, K400, um, that actually are used for payment terminals. Um, and Killy, so this becomes pretty obvious then, Square acquired uh, Killy technology. Um, so it seems that this Square device is actually an old uh, Killy uh, Corp device. So this is pretty cool. Um, let's see if we can find their website. So their website isn't really online anymore, but if we use archive.org, I think it's just killycorp.com. Let's see if I did this right. Okay, yeah. Right, so if we look at the current status of the website, what do we have here? And what we're hoping is there's some old data sheets or stuff like that posted. Unfortunately, we're not really going to get that lucky. So now I think it's just blank. But if we go back in time, you know, when they, before they became part of Square. Here we go. This Killy.ca product solutions, secure processor K400. Um, so this is pretty much what we're assuming the square uh, devices. And some of the stuff I looked at initially actually is if you take a look at the package, um, I actually originally wondered if it was just a rebadge some other microcontroller. And you can see, for example, the crystal pin. So if you pin out this crystal, and it's, this crystal is running at 13.5 megahertz, by the way, this T135. Um, this marking scheme follows, uh, I think, T TSC maybe. There's a, a crystal company. You'll see some other uh, markings very similar so it's t2240 this is a 24 megahertz crystal um, and the bottom numbers are part of just lot codes and stuff like that so um, but yeah this guy here is a 56 pin qfn which is actually not as common a package um, cypress makes some devices but none of them would match this pin out uh, there's some T texas instruments cc devices again none of them match the pin out um, this is before I realized this whole Killy connection thing. So this is a 56-pin QFN, um, which will become vitally important in just a second here because if we take a look at the product brief, unfortunately, there's, there's no full data sheet. They just say contact us. 
Um, so if we take a look at this secure processor, um, and so it has a dual core 32-bit RISC design. There's no real details of, of how that's done, but you can see there's two CPUs. Um, it has built-in NFC, so that's good, right? This is the this square reader supports NFC, so that makes sense. Um, it has, you know, some GPIO stuff. It has battery-backed memory. Um, so this also kind of matches what we saw in this, the square devices. There's this battery back memory. Um, supports various cards, of course, what you expect, blah, blah, blah. And down here, you can see there's the K400Q is in 56-pin QFN. Um, so this is basically what that square device is, right? So it's this Killy technology, which now became square. Um, so it's some custom-ish uh, RISC processor. Um, also important to us is this SDI secure, what do they call that? It's on the, the website. They call it security something something. SDI secure. Oh, there's lots of secure on this. They had a name for this, but it's kind of like a secure destruct or something like that. Um, input. Maybe I want to say secure destruct input. Uh, but basically, this is what's supposed to be a sudden destruction interface. I always close. Um, so this is designed to protect uh, the crypto keys. So so this is presumably what that, that mesh is getting uh, connected to. Um, so you can see now, basically, that what you have is that square device is some sort of custom risk um, implementation. So it's something to go on, right? It's not quite as useful. It'd be interesting to see what the firmware on that thing is. Uh, we can go a little further. We're going to hit a wall shortly here. Um, the second thing, right, is that if you search back in press releases, you'll find uh, a reference to um, who the actual provider of this IP was. You know, the assumption is that this company didn't just build their own risk out of nothing. Um, and so the, you can see a press release here basically saying they use this NCI3250 soft processor core. Um, so that's, and it talks about all the other the features of it that clearly have become the 400Q. Um, you're going to kind of end some of the documentation. So if you look up the documentation, it's NDA. There's some basic stuff available. Um, there's a development suite. Uh, the closest to kind of open is the uh, Lauterbach debugger supports this. Right, which is also pretty expensive, so I don't have one of these, especially with this module. Um, but there is some support for this core. So if you can find other stuff with this RISC core, um, you might be able to find some kind of interesting stuff uh, out of it. And what I looked at is that if you, and you can see where I've soldered some wires on here, um, there's a bunch of pads along the side. So my assumption was these test pads, which are just inside the security enclosure, might be a programming interface for this. And, and what you can see is that, let's see if we get this out here. Um, right, these here actually basically run right to this QFN somewhere along here, and they kind of go in a row, which makes sense for JTAG, right? Normally you have like your JTAG running um, because typically they're routed pretty close to each other, so um, the fact that they're all, and that one's there, this one's over one, and then this one's, I think, over one or two. Um, so you can see there's a series of pins here, and the, the all the, the data sheets make reference to a full JTAG interface, not like, you know, the ARM has the, the SWD, the two-wire interface. Um, so presumably it's a full JTAG interface. Uh, what's interesting is that if you try to power this thing up, um, this device comes online only for, like, you know, I don't know, a few hundred milliseconds, and then shuts off. So the crystal's off, the voltages are off to it. So somebody else is switching this on um, and off. So you, it's not quite as simple to just, you know, uh, do a JTAG scan with a JTAGulator or something. Um, we'll have to first force this on to figure out any of that. And then we're still stuck with the, the interface to it. Okay, so that's kind of as far as I pushed what is this. And so this is a pretty interesting part here. Um, but we're kind of going to hit a wall with lack of documentation and 
stuff like that. So the next thing I wanted to look at is how does the security mesh works, which is sort of the second detail I want to get in this video. Because um, if you remember from before, what I had was I had this um, cover, right, that's going over the reader. And so this cover is supposed to uh, protect this thing, right, so that when if you remove the cover, if you uh, punch through the cover or anything like that, it's going to erase all of the crypto keys. Um, and there's a bunch of contacts, so normally there's some, you know, connection in between. Um, I also missed, so the, the first time I did the teardown, actually I missed a few, a few things the first time. Um, number one was there's actually another tamper switch over here, right? So there's a tamper switch here. Um, there's a, a magnet, so I've actually ripped this apart now, magnetic card reader. So it looks like just two track magnetic card reader. Um, this is looks just purely like uh, coils. I was curious if there's encryption inside this, even in between the two, but it, it doesn't look like it. Um, it could be like a tiny device in there or something, but it really looks like when you when you look at it, just the coil. Um, this is the little flex cable that interconnected the two. And the kind of interesting thing is, oops, wrong way here. If we look at this flex cable, is that there's actually, get it to focus. Um, a so there's a, a a grid a shield on the flex cable. So this little squiggle here, um, actually you can see so that the the reader head is right here. That's why it doesn't go there. It goes to the other side. And then it covers all this area. So this is actually like a tamper shield um, on the flex cable itself. So if you cut the connector or more realistically just unplug the connector, it actually will trip. Um, uh, trip the tamper and you can see that because one of these pins here so I've been soldering onto this you can see it's a bit messy um, one of these pins and so this is where the reader head plugs into goes so I'm going to go from that pin um, and I forget which one it is now it's one of these yeah, so over here, it actually connects to that pad. So it's part of the path is um, this pad right here. So it, as soon as you unplug this um, reader head, what it's going to do is it's going to um, basically trip the tamper. So this is kind of cool because one attack I was originally thinking would be easy to do, which you know now is a little more complicated, is that if you made an interposer here, um, because this is outside the security domain, right? So if we made an interposer, you unplug this, put your interposer, and then plug it back, um, at least to get magnetic card swipe data out of this thing and then record it internally or something. But as soon as you unplug this, uh, it's actually going to trip the tamper. So you'd have to, um, basically, you can short from you know that side over. Uh, but to be able to do that in the case is going to be a little more difficult because of all of the... Uh, stuff around it. So just kind of like a, a interesting little aside. Um, okay, so where, what does this tamper do? Uh, you can see there's basically um, four pads here. And if you use a meter, put it set up like this. Okay. And what you can see Let's find something under this. Is that there's effectively um, these two pads here. So there's sort of like two pads per thing. Even though this one looks like there's like an inner and an outer, they're actually connected together. So if you probe the two of them, you'll see you get zero ohm. Um, and basically it's like the two inner pads on one side connect to each other. So it's like 7.6 ohms. It's not quite zero, right? And the two outer pads connect. And then same over here, the two inner pads connect and the two outer pads connect. And there's no connection between the two sides. Um, I wasn't sure at first, and we'll see in a second what, what this was supposed to be for, but there's these weird like dimples in the middle, right? So you can see the pattern, you can see these dimples. Um, 
these actually are are there on purpose, but I think it's a feature that's not used. And uh, we can see that I believe it was for um, analysis of like failure analysis and stuff. But I'll show you where that comes from in a second. Um, on the the pad itself, so if we take a look at that, um, right? Remember these had these little zebra connections here. So these zebra strips basically have um, so named because they alternate normally. Uh, they have a bunch of, of vertical connections. So this goes in here, and this will connect this pad to the top and so forth. Um, in the actual board, we can sort of pin out quickly what the, the connections are. Um, so interestingly, one side of these goes to ground. So if I go negative, I'm just going to use the smart card interface. Um, what you'll see is this side here. So this, this lower pad on both sides going to ground. Um, so there's clearly some, right, some symmetry here. Um, and then I already showed you there was a connection between the, um, uh, to this guy here. Um, the other side of it, so if you remember this side here is going to one of, um, I believe this one right here. Um, where is this being connected? Interestingly, where it's actually getting connected is over here on the left of the board. And this wire goes down here, which actually comes from the backup battery. So the backup battery is being routed onto, um, well, this is just some circuitry that does the, the backup uh, power supply uh, monitoring and stuff like that and uh, maintenance. But it actually goes to this connector right, which then goes in the shield. So the shield seems to just have a constant voltage, at least on this half. It's not like an alternating pattern that you sometimes see. Um, so that backup battery voltage is then being routed here um, via the shield. So the two outers will go together. So this connection would then go to, to that inner one there. Um, and, and that would be, you know, ground here is being routed over here to this. This would be the, the backup plus three volt backup value that then goes to here. Um, I haven't actually found where that goes onward. It, it goes to some capacitors right here. It might be an internal layer and it's going over to this guy. I suspect it's somewhere in here with some other circuitry in between it. Um, but it gets kind of cool because if, if you really want to understand what the shield is doing, um, we actually have a way to do that. And where did I go here? So if we take a look, the nice thing about it, so this was the old article, um, is I started looking at stuff and Squares filed a bunch of patents. So this is kind of handy because you can actually see what they're, what they're, they're thinking. So this is an older patent um, that talks about how they do some tamper protection match. Uh, once you start getting into newer ones, um, right, so they actually have... If you take a look at this, and let me get the, so I'm just gonna switch between the two of them, right? This is their diagram, and then there's the, the, the board we have. Again, their diagram, you can see like these depressions um, right here. We see the pads, stuff like that. Um, again, here's our actual thing. So we have the depressions here, the pad. So it matches perfectly. Um, so we actually have some some pretty good details that we can get about what we're supposed to see. Uh, that I probably wouldn't have guessed otherwise, to be honest. Uh, which one is? Yeah. So and here's the connection. They even have the exact connection between the two that I measured. Um, one interesting thing is they have some like varying voltage they call it. So I'm not positive what this is uh, if this is the case or not, but it seems like you know, the idea here is these are not direct shorts. And, you know, I measured about set six or seven ohms. So the idea is that if you um, had a, if someone tried to short it with a wire, it would be noticeably different from the actual mesh um, itself. Um, and they do talk about how, you know, how the circuitry does the the measuring of it. So this is like a static voltage, um, which we can kind of pin out a little bit where that's going. I'm not positive if this is fully implemented as is because, you know, what we have, they have this 2.2, but instead it looks like the backup 
battery. This doesn't look like the tamper circuit in the system. So in the system, it's like the backup battery. So we had this little backup battery here. Um, and this is directly, as far as I can tell, getting routed over one side of the mesh. So the mesh has like the two sides. Um, and one side seems to just have the straight battery voltage. So this is a little different than what's in the patent um, is, is kind of the gist of what I've seen so far. Um, the other thing is what are these depressions, right? I, I mentioned that before. Um, they explain that the, the depressions are actually for, uh, a t so they call it a tamper zone recess where there's no, so you can see there's insulative coating here and there's none here. Um, and that's for doing analysis after the fact. Basically, we'll let someone probe the mesh. Um, if, you know, there was a fault in the mesh and you want to figure out where it happened, this gives you sort of a test point to measure it. But as far as I can tell, and maybe I'm doing something wrong, but if you try to probe here, um, like these can are, are not, there's no connectivity here. And it looks like it's still coded with the same thing. So it might have just been for... Uh, debugging they use that and then they just filled it in with the the insulation in the final but yeah so that's kind of cool right is you can actually see um from this patent what the 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 mesh is all about um they also have some other pretty cool stuff so if we look back at the board let's zoom in a little here right and at first again i didn't catch all of this for sure um if you take a look at this there's sort of the there's a vertical holder where the zebra um, strip is going. There's the two pads, right, which are clearly for the uh, tamper. But there's this, there's a ring around it too, right, which I thought maybe was just a test point or something like that. Um, but they actually explain in another patent what the deal here is. Um, and so this is pretty cool, I think. If we take a look, so there's some different embodiments of it, as there always is. Once again, we see our friend, this mesh cover. Um, and we also even see somewhere we have those same zebra connectors. So we see everything really. Um, but yeah, what's kind of cool is you basically have, and so this is exactly, oops, yeah, there's the zebra. So here are those zebra connectors I mentioned, right? So there's a bunch of uh, vertical conductors interspliced with insulators. Um, but yeah, here's exactly what we have. Is we have a... Oh, come on. There we go. Right. We have this thing in the bottom here where there's like this vertical a holder around it. We have a guard ring and stuff like that. Um, and the idea of this guard ring, and you, you, on the board, it looks like a bunch of the guard rings get connected together. So um, it's somewhat simple to implement. Uh, the idea of this guard ring is simply that if someone were to flood the area with conductive um, ink. So an attack on these is that, you know, if you get in here with a syringe, so if you take a look at this, right, say you had a way under the case, it's not a perfect seal, and you just kind of squirt some conductive stuff in here, um, maybe you're able to, to make these two pads connect. Um, the idea is that you all you now have this guard ring here, right? So if you squirt some conductive ink, it's also going to short here and here, which should never get shorted. Um, so the guard ring helps you detect an attacker that's kind of trying to shimmy in this way. Or maybe they just have like a, you know, conductive shim or whatever else, and they'll hopefully hit the guard ring. Um, so that's the basic I idea of that, right? So it's kind of cool. Um, and you actually see it, and they explain this. I also missed this until I kind of read the the info on it, that this button here, so this is that tamper button, right? So it's just, it looks like a standard little button. If you open it up, you'll notice there's three, you know, this is, I think, ground. Okay, that makes sense, right? There's a middle, but there's this other ring, which is it just mechanical or something like that? No, this is actually a guard ring as well, because the way the button closes, right, it should only ever be able to contact that middle pad and the outer pad. Um, and so this this third little thin one is actually a guard ring as well. Um, and so if someone tries to shim in from the side, right, to, to bypass the button, um, in theory it should short the guard ring and trip the circuit as well. So there's a few little tricks like that um, built in there. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is that 
I, I mentioned the earlier one uh, had different looking tamper circuitry, right? So you can see the, the connection pads are different. Um, you can see the, if we go to the tamper circuit, the tamper shield itself looks different. So um, they actually mention, and here they do have, oops, sorry, I don't have that up. Here they do have a little guard ring as well around it. Um, the guard ring doesn't have that, you know, that third, the, the holder going up. It looks like a more basic implementation. Um, and what it seems like is they actually talk about in the patent that there was issues. I don't know if they have photos of the old one. No, they start right there. Um, there was issues with the old design apparently that it was uh, likely to have like false positives during um, sort of in use effectively was the problem. So it seems like they've added this these additional features to to deal with false positives on the um, the guard rings themselves. Um, so where where does that leave us? The one thing I haven't talked too much about is where these things connect to. So we know already on one side. Um, we have battery voltage in here, 3.3 volts, that's also routed through um, the tamper protect for the mag stripe reader that gets routed to here. Um, the other side actually, move this wire, sorry, seems to connect over to the STM32F0. So this is kind of cool. Um, you'll notice so one thing that caught my eye and you know at first was a little weird it actually makes sense now is this stm32 f0 it has like crap here right it's got this epoxy covering on it um and actually same with this device too which is a little suspicious so if you look at this let's see if we can see this here um okay where is it here we go right so here's the stm32 f0 i've kind of prodded at it that's why this stuff looks weird um and there's also some, I don't know these pads, these seem to be next to the um, the touchscreen interface, but you know, you have a bit of epoxy here and it's only on specific areas. So it's kind of weird, like I originally was thinking, okay, it's just some ceiling or something, but it's only on very specific areas. Um, also around here, right? So why is that? Um, I don't know exactly. We, because I, it must be to prevent someone from reaching in and, and prodding these pins. Uh, but what you see is some of these pins actually, so you can just kind of probe some edges here. Um, and when you probe these, what you'll find is that they actually go to the, so let's just do that. So you can see too, um, I think it's, I can't remember which one it is. Oops. Yeah, so it's this one connects to here. And I think this other one, one of these is ground. Okay, so that's ground. What's this? Does this connect up here? And it could be that it's under the epoxy. Remember, there's some stuff I can't really reach right now easily because of I haven't bothered to remove this. Um, maybe it's this other one. Anyway, there, there is some more connections that you can make. Um, so what's kind of cool is that it's like very clear that some of this tamper, I think is, oh, uh, there's another one, yeah. I think is implemented on the STM32F0, um, which would be pretty interesting because that might be something we can take a look at um, with more detail than the other uh, square I see. Um, we'll have the microscope up. I kind of want to finish off where are we here? Uh, finish off a few things I couldn't, I didn't have enough magnification to look at. So interestingly, there's another device here and this looks like, you know, some sort of chip scale packaging that also looks to have a square logo on it. Um, so this is some other, I don't know what this device is around it. So it, it's some sort of BGA. You can just see, you know, the, the connection, where's it? Here it is, um, to the, bunch of capacitors, right? There's a whole bunch of capacitors here. So um, maybe this is something to do with backup power. I don't know, it's, right? 
it's kind of unusual, let's say, especially that they'd have a custom IC if it's just backup power. Um, but it's some more stuff to investigate. I mean, anything that's some sort of custom device is, of course, going to be interesting. Um, the other device I didn't mention before, I think I linked it, was there's an analog MUX here. So if you look up this, I don't know if you'll be able to see the part number. Uh, but I have a link to it. So it's just like a, a, some sort of analog MUX. So that's either for the MagStripe reader. I originally figured it could also be for the tamper detect. I mean, again, it's it's all weird when it has this uh, this stuff around it like that. And you have some really small test pads here. Um, so there's quite a bit of interesting stuff going on this board. Uh, the smart card reader, these are likely ESD devices. You can see them shine there. Um, but it's probably just some ESD protection. Uh, using some really small devices, uh, probably a clock crystal here. Um, again, this is the main NXP device we haven't looked at at all, uh, which is has some tamper detect stuff as well. The square device again. Um, this is the other one I didn't mention before. So this is a let's see if you can see the part number here. Ice SLP 2K. Um, so we have a little FPGA uh, in here as well. Um, which is kind of, so the other kind of cool thing I found when I was reviewing some of these square, uh, patent stuff was there's even a patent. So there's one, I think I've got it up somewhere here. Uh, security housing. No, not this one. So they have a patent. I just put a big list of them here. That's like the, the whole device. Um, there's nothing really interesting in it, but I mean, you know, it's always good whenever you can find details about this stuff. So they talk about, let's see, they basically talk about um, tamper protection circuitry. There's another patent related to tamper protection circuitry. Um, and one of them even, you know, talks about there being a uh, FPGA and stuff like that involved in it, uh, which is, you know, again, makes sense. If we see that FPGA there, um, this FPGA was on the, I'm not sure if it's this one. Uh, was on the previous generation as well. So um, you do have, yeah, I think this is kind of showing you some of their architecture. Let's just take a look at that. Can I rotate you? No. Okay, so sorry, it's sideways, but um, you can see here, right, power supply, contactless inter... Oop. Um, okay, contactless interface, so the NFC... Um, so here it's actually saying that the FPGAs use a signal conditioning for that, which is sort of interesting, um, something to pin out. But then you have your cryptographic processor, which I believe would be their uh, device, and then you have a general purpose one, which I believe would be the NXP device. So you can sort of see um, some of the architecture in um, this patent here, but... Yeah, that's kind of a quick overview of the security module inside this, wherever it went, there it is. Um, so hopefully you found it interesting. I know it's a bit uh, ad hoc, but you can find quite a bit about this. I mean, these are pretty cool little things. Um, if you're interested in it, you can also avoid killing the expensive square terminal because you can get the cheaper, older reader. So this is the one I kind of referenced here, right? Is this device, I think is like 50 bucks or something on... Uh, Amazon and it, it has a lot of the same uh, internals it doesn't have the STM 32 F0 uh, which looks to be doing some of the tamper so if I get some more time um, I'll take a look at it I don't I, this is kind of what I wanted to do initially and there's a whole stuff related to the Android side of it too um, but yeah if you know if you find one see what else you can figure out about this thing it's a pretty interesting device and hope you enjoyed it